Hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Stitargus Gosh, Honey Stoker. And as you just witnessed, the dwarves have just left our new subaquatic meeting hall to get to work because there really is a lot to do around the place. Despite the fact that we can no longer go to the surface due to our new uh, pool arrangement out here at the bottom of the pit, which is now completely submerged, and remember also that we can no longer go down to the caverns due to this forgotten beast out here with Ona Datari a particularly scary one, made of charcoal, and who also has wings and poisonous gas, which I believe makes him a fairly tough customer. The thing also seems frighteningly eager to get into the fortress, which is also a bit scary, but it's fine, we're locked up safe. No worries, for the time being. Now as for projects going on in our fortress, we do have our quartzite chambers down here, which I am still hoping to make into a future meeting hall, possibly. We're just trying to get this cleaned up a bit by getting all the mud out of there. And we're also doing some smoothing as well, both down here on ground level and up above as well. I'm hoping to eventually make this meeting hall two Z levels high. And I would like some engravings up above. I think that'd be a nice touch. And then of course we also have our magma bridge as well. Another huge project. Now we currently have all the parts that we're going to need for the screw pumps, which is what we're going to use to get the magma from down far below underground to this level. But getting them all in place is going to be a pain and that's going to take a while. But as long as we stay on top of it, I think it's possible to get all the screw pumps in place by the end of the episode. Not too sure, we'll see what happens. At the moment there is a long way to go on that. Now onto other fortress matters, it looks like Atis, one of our farmers, is uh, currently throwing a tantrum here in our meeting hall. And it also looks like they punched one of our war wild boars, which is unfortunate. How we've been dealing with these dwarves is taking them and throwing them down in the quartzite caverns in our little asylum area. Remember that we carved out a few of the stalagmites down there and threw some doors up to kind of make some prison chambers because we don't want to exile dwarves like this out into the world and hurt the other living dwarves. That wouldn't be good at all. But I have noticed a little problem down here because as you can see, the dwarves that we throw down here, most of the time they just go berserk. Like you can see these two dwarves here, completely insane. And if we open up the door, then they would come out and attack our other dwarves, which of course is not very good at all. But these two over here, dwarves who were throwing tantrums, like if we have a look at Ezum here, well, she is doing absolutely fine. Having a look in her mind here, you can see she's dejected after a lack of decent meals. She feels a self-pity after a lack of abstract thinking, dejected after dwelling upon being kept from alcohol. And she also has many other negative thoughts as well. And seeing as how she was locked down here initially because she was throwing tantrums, you would think that all these negative thoughts would push her right over the edge. But that is not the case. In fact, she's not stressed at all, which is very odd to me. And you know what? A dwarf like this, I am willing to try them back out in the fortress again. I mean, why not? In fact, a few of the dwarves who are out here feel the same exact way. Like this guy here, Monam. Again, he feels isolated, worried, restless, all kinds of negative thoughts, but he's not stressed at all. It does not make a ton of sense to me, but hell, if we can manage to get them out there and back to the fortress, then that would actually be great, wouldn't it? Although, that does present us with a little bit of a problem. Because remember, the Quartzide Caverns is where that forgotten beast is, with Ona Datari, and we cannot safely get out there unless we defeat this monster first. Something I don't know if we should try or not. Honestly, a little frightening. However, while this beast does currently seem fairly content milling around this gate down here, if it does end up stumbling into the asylum caverns, it can easily tear the doors off those stalagmites and kill the dwarves inside, which would be a terrible shame. Now, the only thing I could think to do is to send down the boar bloods, which I really do not want to do, mostly because I got this whole uh, not wanting our one military squad to be demolished thing going on. But as we were discussing last episode, Oh my goodness, okay, um, it looks like we have another vile force of darkness from the Torment of Witches here at Honey Stoker. Fantastic, well, that's not gonna really affect us too much, I don't think, because they can't get down to the fortress and we're not going out there. So you guys can just hang out up here for a while, not too concerned about you. Although, uh, oh dear, it looks like the human diplomat is here and has been waiting outside our fortress, but of course they can't get in, so, um, well, not much we could do for you, I guess. Terribly sorry, dude. Uh, just, uh, try to hide for a while, I suppose. 
which it looks like he's doing. Okay. Stay cool, dude, and maybe go home, huh? Anyways. Right, we were discussing the Forgotten Beast. I could send the squads out, which would definitely be the simplest option. These are our best trained dwarves, and they have the best equipment in the fortress. Iron armor, steel weapons, and some artifacts even. And on top of that, when you get down to it, this beast down here is made out of charcoal. Which is tough, I mean, the thing's not going to bleed to death, sure. And it can't feel pain either, but charcoal is much lighter than rock. Maybe this thing will just kind of break apart when we attack it. And if we had all the dwarves grouped up to fight the thing, then I suppose that would really increase our chances, right? Hmm, you know, I think I'm starting to warm to the idea. Yeah, you know, if we call the boar bloods down to this room right here, and then open up that gate, then they could all charge out in a single large group. And I imagine the combat would be over pretty quickly. As long as charcoal is as frail as I hope it will be. And as long as that gas doesn't actually affect our dwarves. Yeah, you know what? I think we're gonna have to try it. I don't like it, but I'm not sure we have another option. Not if we want a chance at saving some of these dwarves out here anyways. Yes, boar bloods, it's time to move out. Yes, and here they go, heading out of the meeting hall with their war wild boars. I did make sure to take one last look too, and they are in fact all geared up. Everyone is equipped with their weapons and armor, and so we're good on that front. Ugh, the only problem I'm seeing here is the wild boars. We're already taking a pretty big risk setting the dwarves out, but that forgotten beast has that poisonous gas, and I really don't think it's going to affect our vampires at all. But the wild boars are still breathing, and so maybe it's best if we, uh, put them away somewhere for now, just to be safe. I'll just turn on the water burrow here, and I imagine that should do the trick. Yeah, okay, looks like they're heading back to the fortress. Very good. Sorry, pigs. Next time. And now we'll just have to get somebody to come down here and pull this lever. Oh boy, things are moving pretty fast, huh? Starting to have some second thoughts about the whole thing, but I suppose it's too late now. We have to do what we have to do, boar bloods. This will be our first great challenge, and if we die here, then so be it. We'll have died heroes. The lever is pulled, the gate is down, and things are about to get started here. Taking things slowly, it looks like the boar bloods are grouping up at the back of the chamber, but are now recentering. Withona Datari is now moving through this narrow hallway, moving in. Oh, and some of the vampires have spotted it and have begun to charge. We have some gas here. The beast has just barged into the chamber, but luckily has not yet damaged anybody. The battle continues, more gas is being sprayed. We do have one dwarf here running off like a coward. Oh, go figure, it's Brash Young Moldy. I would never have pegged him for a coward. Luckily, it looks like the beast has still not done anything to the dwarves. Fantastic. And in fact, I'm seeing several pieces of it laying about the chamber now. Can't be much longer now. The boar bloods are doing fantastic work. Ah, and just wonderful. They've killed the beast. Withona Datari has fallen. Fantastic work, boar bloods. Just beautiful. Now, before we get too excited, I'm going to take a look at some of the dwarves to see if they have any health problems from the gas. And you know, it looks like they're pretty good, actually. Several of them seem fairly tired. And for unsleeping vampires, that seems a little strange. But, yeah, I'm not seeing any big problems at all. Yeah, you know what? I'm thinking we're in the clear. Well, that was a total success, dwarves. We killed the beast with no problem whatsoever. Oh, would you look at that? It looks like it was put down by Id Yuristvath Sith, the fortress's best warrior. That is one hell of a notch to add to your spear. Good job, dude. And with that, I suppose we could release some of our crazy dwarves up this way. Ezum, Monam, and Zuglar. They all seem to be doing fine. And so, welcome back to the fortress, you bastards. I can't wait for you to see our new meeting hall and our new pool as well. It should be interesting for you. And now, boar bloods, I'm not going to be sending you home quite yet. No, no. For you see, recently dwarves have detected rumblings coming from the upper cavern levels. A dire portent, and it could only be one thing. Yet another forgotten beast. And if we're to make Honeystoker safe, it must be dealt with. And so if you dwarves could be so kind, you'll have to make your way to the eastern portion of the Quartzite Caverns. Position yourselves at the bottom of the ramp that leads up to the first cavern layer. It is there we will begin our hunt. And yes, this time you may bring your boars, for we'll need all the help we can get against this dire foe. Yes, you mighty boar bloods, 
As the dwarf makes their way over to pull the lever, you had best gird your loins and steel yourselves. For soon a mighty battle will ensue. And if you fail, our fortress will fall. The lever is pulled. And the gate up to the first cavern lair is open. And so let's not tarry in choosing our battlefield. For surely the trembling earth belies the presence of a forgotten terror. And from somewhere out in those fungus-choked caverns, the beast approaches. Upon great frost-caked wings, it flits silently through the tunnels, its gaunt form casting but a narrow shadow. Its name is Azok, and it is an enormous blob composed of snow, and it's dead. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I guess I wasn't really expecting that much. Snow. Eh. Certainly better than charcoal. That's for damn sure. <laughs> Anyways. Back to work, dwarves. Yeah, we have a lot to do now that we have access to the caverns once more. We can come down here, get some trees chopped down. Fantastic, just wonderful. Oh, then of course the Tower of Memories. We're still doing some engraving in there and working our way downwards. I know I haven't touched on it in a few episodes, but work is progressing. Oh, then of course down here, still trying to get our new meeting hall area cleaned up. You can see we've taken care of some of that mud, but there's still a bit to go. Up top, all the engravings are in place and we're trying to get rid of some of this stone here. It's getting there. And actually, another project we were working on before we sent the boar bloods out was here in our new meeting hall, where I realized one important thing we were missing is a mist generator. Something I think the vampires would really like in here. And so we're gonna try a little bit of something here. You can see up this way, I already have some grates placed in the ground. And then down below, we have a tunnel dug out already that leads far, far down to this level here in the first cavern layer. And back here in the meeting hall, if we look above these grates, you'll notice this little section of the wall here, where there is currently an opened floodgate that is linked up to a lever. Now I'm thinking we can dig a channel into this wall here, which will get rid of this wall and also give that water access to the meeting hall, which will very easily create a new mist generator. And at that point, the only fear would be that too much water would come in. But I don't think that's something we have to worry about really. There is an awful lot of drainage. So let's have a stab at it. And yes, I do realize that this water is coming from a previously flooded portion of our fortress. And if too much water does come in, we'll be flooded in both water and irony. Oh, here comes a dwarf. Okay, all right, the water's going down and into the meeting hall at a pretty slow rate. <laughs> Alrighty. Yeah, you know, it looks to be working absolutely fine for the time being, but we'll give it a second. Yeah, you know, it looks to be doing fine. Fantastic. Yet, yeah, and the water is being drained out of the pit above. And I imagine it's also being replenished from the same place it came from, the waterway beneath our hospital. And so I don't think it's going to run out, but I suppose we'll see. We'll just get this floodgate over here closed up so there's no unfortunate accidents. There we go, fantastic. Well, all right. Yeah, it looks like we're good to go. We have missed, dwarves. Excellent. And so now that we have that all settled, I will also note that up here on the surface, the siege has dispersed. And really, they weren't here for all that long either. Just a couple seasons. Although, it does look like before they departed, they took care of that human diplomat, who is now sitting on this siltstone road, quite dead. Probably not a good thing. I can't imagine the humans are going to be too happy about that. But we are still locked away nice and safe, so... Hmm, guess I'm not too worried. Over here to our temple area, I will note that At here is still praying. It almost seems like she's in some sort of a trance. She has not left this room once, in probably a year or so, which is more than a little worrying. At this point, the other dwarves around the fortress have begun to take notice, I'm sure, and I think we should try to get her out of there. It's one thing to be faithful to your gods, but we need you too, Atir, and so I'm gonna try to snap her out of it by getting rid of the Chapel of Nature, just for now anyways. Still says she's worshiping, that is strange. Well, maybe if we could just get her out of the room, maybe that'll work. How about we try turning on a burrow, like the meeting hall here? All right, well, that got her out of the temple at least. That's right, go spend some time at the meeting hall, will you? And while she's down there, I'm gonna lock up these doors so she can't come in here anymore. Okay, so Atir is now down in the meeting hall socializing with the other dwarves. That's good, something she hasn't done in about a year, really. Hmm, well, that works for us, I suppose. That's right, just take it easy, Atir, get a drink, maybe. And soon, I'm sure you'll be back to your old self. Really hoping anyways. Very strange. Well, well here's something. A new artifact. 
Doran Batakog, the dwarf armorer vampire, has created Ishen Moshun, a silver helm. He offers it to the Keeper of Bees. Fantastic. I will note too that I was trying to get him to make it out of black bronze, like those other armor artifacts that we've had, but he would only use silver, and I suspect that's because it's one of his favorite metals. Anywho, let's have a look at this thing. Its name translates to the Passion of Suicide. Terrifying and incredibly dark, and it's worth 38,000, which is all right. This is a silver helm. All craft dwarfship is of the highest quality. It is encrusted with tapered baguette cut praises and encircled with bands of silver, rectangular lignite cabochons, and sand pear wood. This object menaces with spikes of praise, pig bone, and dog bone. On the item is an image of Xanag Gilt Handles the Dwarf in Milk Quartz. Very interesting, fairly simple, but I do like it, certainly. It has those touches of praise on there, as well as those bone spikes. Very cool. The only thing is Xanag Gilt Handles. I'm kind of curious as to who that is. We've stepped out of Fortress Mode, and I'm now taking a look through Legends Mode, and it looks like Xanag was born in 109 nearly 200 years ago, and they didn't do very much from their birth up till 174 when they became a dancer, at which point they began an apprenticeship under the elf Kanibo Yonrocks, then became a member of the Poems of Extricating, which looks to have been a performance troupe. She then moved to Length Beach in order to be with the master, Length Beach being a forest retreat, a home of elves when they were still around. Oh, then it looks like she married Kivish Dorwaxed. That's nice, and it looks like he was the mayor of a dwarven settlement. Very cool but it does look like at some point he was infected by the Werehorse curse and fled to the wilds. A damn shame. And back to Xanag, it looks like in the years following the infection of her husband, it looks like she participated in a few foot races and worked fondled, although she never won any of them. A couple years after that, she was attacked by a Night Ogress, Ufalo Deadgraves, a creature who has existed since the very beginning of time and who in fact still stalks the night till this very day. Oof, terrifying. But it looks like Xanag was able to escape, thankfully. The following year, a human named Acro Lunches Vines was denied an apprenticeship under Xanag because her elven master Kanibo Yonrox was jealous. Oh, but then it looks like Xanag ceased being the apprentice under the elf Kanibo Yonrox. She didn't like being held back like that. Understandable. Oh, and then she became the master of that human anyways. Ah, and then the following year, she became a baroness of the Scraped Chambers, our civilization and settled and worked fondled, the capital. But she only remained in the position for two years, because in 209, when Xanag was traveling through the jungle of fury, she was attacked by a goblin, and unfortunately was killed, and then devoured. Oh, that's a damn shame right there, and quite a story to boot. I could see why you'd put an image of this dwarf on your helmet. Just marvelous. And yes, this was a bit of a departure from our Honeystoker antics, but you know, I really had fun with it. It's good to see the stories out there in the world. I'm curious how many of the other dwarves in the fortress have heard of Xanag. Quite a few of them, I'm sure. It is a terribly interesting story. Anyways, a fantastic helmet. And you know what? I think a helmet like that should go to one of our warriors. But who? You know, I am tempted to give the thing to Lore, our Lord Tactician, but instead I think I'm going to award it to Id. Mel Bill knows the guy deserves it. Dude's been around forever and he's our fort's best warrior. Yeah, let's do that. Here you are, my friend. Wear it proudly and also be sure to grab the thing quickly, because we have a little bit of a problem over here in our hospital. If you have a look, we have two dwarves in here currently, Ast and Duma, a Skinner and Tanner, both of whom have been causing a lot of troubles here in the fortress, and instead of throwing them in the quartzite asylum like we've been doing, I instead ordered them to be punished, and so they were both beaten by a couple of the boar bloods, and so that's why they're in here. Although it looks like Ast has gone berserk, and I have to imagine he's gonna rip Duma apart. Uh, that's not great. Well, boar bloods, it looks like we have to get in there. Let's move out. Now, I'm gonna take this slowly because I am curious if we can save this other dwarf in here, although I'm not feeling too hopeful about that. It looks like Duma is trying to run out of the hospital at the moment, even though he is beaten severely, and he's being chased by Ast, who is severely injured as well, and who looks to have very quickly given up the chase. Hmm, all right. Well, let's follow Ast and uh, just watch him. And I'm also going to speed things up a bit. All right, looks like Ast is coming out of the hospital. Oh, and has found a Kia and a war wild boar to fight. Oh, <laughs> that was very quick. And it looks like the problem is over. He was put down by Kogan, who chopped Ast's head right off with her axe. A single hit. Wow, brutal. 
Well, good job, Kogan. It had to be done. Alright, well, somebody get this mess taken care of. And let this be a reminder to you other vampires. We cannot have any troublemakers in the fortress. It simply will not be allowed. Not while we're up here, you may take a look over down towards the pit here, and notice that it no longer has any water in it at all. Yeah, I've been letting some time pass, and have noted that the water was draining. And at this point, the pit is completely dry. But I don't really feel safe going out there right now. Mostly because another siege has arrived. I didn't even bother bringing it up, just a waste of time, really. And they can't get to us anyways. So, whatever. That being said, it doesn't really seem like they have any interest in attacking our fortress at all. Because they're up here in this corner, kind of, um, well... You know, I'm not too sure what they're doing. <laughs> it looks like most of the goblins have arranged themselves in sort of a pile configuration and are partaking in some sort of a... You know, I'm not too sure. And you know what? I don't think I want to know what they're doing, honestly. We'll just leave them to it. Uh, anywho, yes, the pit is now dry, and we're not going to go out there just yet. But I do intend on finding out another way to get water in here. I think the dwarves did kind of like their pool configuration. It seemed to be working out pretty well. But as the vampires of Honeystoker leisurely discuss plans of a new pool, yet another ageless monstrosity has crept its way up from the deepest reaches of the Eternal Realms. Like a mountain under mountains, its titanic frame struggles to find its way through the narrow passages beneath the fortress. Its beady eyes set firmly on Stetarguskash. The forgotten beast of Feia has come. A great turtle with external ribs. It has large mandibles and it has a bloated body. Its clear scales are oval-shaped and set far apart. Beware, it's poisonous bite. Alright, looks like we have another forgotten beast on our hands. A feia, a turtle with a bloated body and poisonous bite. Well, dwarves, we've already taken down two forgotten beasts so far this episode. And I think it's time we had a third. What do you say? Well, from the looks of it, the turtle is perched up in a tree down here in the third cavern layer, far, far from the fortress. And having a look here, hmm, you know, I'm not gonna say this thing can get to the fortress for sure. In fact, it really seems like hardly any of them can. Well, let's call out the Boarbloods. And I'm gonna have them move to the same chamber that we fought with Thona Datari in. It kind of serves as a midpoint between our fortress and the third cavern layer. And on top of that, I'm gonna send the dwarves to the meeting hall once more just to be safe. All right, now that we're all set, let's follow Efeya and see what it does. Crawling around in the branches of this spore tree here, possibly doing some grazing. All right, well, it seems content down here for the time being. Well, I'll tell you what, Boarbloods, it looks like it's time to go on a hunt. To me, it looks like that creature can reach the fortress, and just to be safe, I want it taken care of. And so let's call those Boarbloods down to the third cavern lair. And I'll tell you what, because they're going to be heading down here and blocking the passage between that beast and our fortress, I'm going to turn off the burrow as well. We still have a lot of work to do, and I think it's going to be fine. Okay, and here come the boar bloods, heading down. Looks like they're just approaching the tunnel that leads down to the third cavern layer. Excellent. And Efeya is still up in this tree here. So be it. We're on our way, turtle. What was that? That wasn't from down here in the caves. That came from the surface. Boar bloods. Something approaches. And whatever it is, it sounds huge. Long ago, before the birth of the Eternal Realms, before even Ono, god of gems, sprinkled the heavens with his twinkling stars, and before even Ifen covered the lands with blankets of green, Deep in the glowing forges of the gods, a titanic creature was forged. To this day, it remains in the Eternal Realms, the purpose of its creation long since forgotten, and its once brilliant sheen now tarnished with the passage of eons. The Bronze Colossus Athaka Renoyivu Esathela has come, a gigantic magic statue made of bronze and bent on mayhem. Oh boy, Athaka has finally come down from the eastern mountains to try its hand at destroying our small fortress. Utterly terrifying. Well, here it is up on the surface, moving in a bit towards the east. I'm gonna start following the thing, just to see what it does. I don't think this thing can get down into the fortress, I really hope it can't. But it does seem to be moving with some purpose, which is horrifying. 
Oh, it seems to have spotted these humans over here. Huh. Um, the new human diplomat and their entourage. Yeah, of course, we couldn't let them in this year either. And so they've been waiting out there. Wow, would you look at this human bowman here? Fighting a bronze colossus. Oh, and dodging, dodging very well. Oh man, this is something here. Oh, and they're flying through the air. Oh, and they've died. Oh, and the Colossus has spotted the Diplomat, and they're crushed. Just like that. Well, you know, whatever keeps him up on the surface, this isn't something we can deal with. It's certainly not now, and, you know, I'm not too sure if we could ever deal with something like this, honestly. Oh, wait a second. It seems to have found the Goblin Siege, and is just wading in. Ooh, look at that. Well, you know, I'm not a big fan of those goblins, to be sure, but it could be that they'll uh, help us out a bit with this beast. Ooh, blood everywhere. I'm seeing a bunch of wounded trolls, a dead beak dog, dead goblins. They don't seem able to do very much to this creature, which is exactly the reason I don't want to go up there and fight it. Oh, now they have pushed the thing down into the pond, and it's splashing about, making one hell of a mess, I'm sure, sunken into this murky pool while goblins surround the pool and shoot at it with their crude bows. Oh man, this is great. All that mist spraying about all over the place. Well, you know, I'm not one to vouch for the goblins very often, that's for damn sure, but you gotta admire their bravery going down into this water to fight the creature. Well, I suppose there is a fine line between bravery and stupidity. Yeah, actually, never mind, they're not brave. Just stupid. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, this is going great so far. We have goblins falling left and right. Man, oh man, can they even take this thing down? It's a pretty big goblin siege up there. Probably 120 members originally. And honestly, I'll be surprised if they can't defeat it. With that many goblins working at the thing, you'd have to think they'd take it down eventually. Especially with Athaka mired in this pool here. It doesn't seem to be that effective of a combatant when it's in here. But still, it doesn't seem like the goblins could do much to the thing regardless. It keeps trying to come out, and then it appears to be pushed back in by the goblins. There are a ton of goblins now in the pool going after the creature, climbing over its mighty frame. Yeah, this has to be one hell of a mess. Mud, blood, the goblin bodies. Imagine what the dwarves must be thinking down in the fortress. They must hear the rumbling and the muffled cries of the goblins. Phenomenal, this is a titanic battle right here. Taking a quick look at Athaka here, and yeah, they have sustained quite a bit of damage. Broken hands, smashed open feet, fractures and dents all over the place. Not surprised, really, the thing is covered with a goblin army. You know, at this point, I'm not sure which one I'm rooting for. It'd be nice to get rid of that bronze colossus, but it would also be very nice to get rid of this goblin army, too. Oh, hold on now. It looks like Athaka has gotten out of the pool and is now standing here in the middle of all these goblins. Oh, the thing is hanging in there big time. Some of the goblins I can see are panicking. It must have done a bunch of damage to him while it was out there. <laughs> this is great. Keep going, Athaka. Hang in there. Oh, hey, look at that. It looks like at some point the siege left. <laughs> Wouldn't blame him. Wow, that was great. Bunch of dead goblins all over the place. Smashed trolls and beak dogs. And then we have Athaka crawling out of that muddy pool. I imagine its legs are broken and that's why it's crawling now. Fantastic. And thank you, by the way, Athaka, for dealing with those damn goblins. <laughs> so... Now we have a badly damaged Bronze Colossus outside our fortress. Again, we are locked up safely, so I don't think we have to worry about it just yet. Although, we're going to have to deal with it eventually. The warriors are getting restless. And speaking of which, the Boarbloods are still waiting patiently down here in the third cavern lair. And it looks like Aphaya still has not moved from their tree. Well, warriors, what do you say? Let's move out. We have a forgotten beast to kill. But unfortunately, I think the actual combat will have to wait until the next episode. Which is fine by me. It's good to know it'll have an exciting start. Ah, now then, just a quick wrap up here. A bit of an exciting episode, we killed two forgotten beasts, and we also bore witness to a titanic duel between a goblin siege and a bronze colossus. Which was terribly thrilling. Athaka is still up on the surface, badly damaged, and I imagine will sort of act as a, a bit of a guardian, which I don't have a huge problem with, although maybe we can think of something more interesting to do with it. I'll put some thought into it. And then over this way here in our pit, it's now completely dry and I would like to fill it up once more, except I'm not too sure how to do that. But we'll come up with something. No worries on that. 
And the last and most exciting piece of news, to me anyways, is that Atir is no longer stuck in her meditative trance, and has once more rejoined the Fortress Dwarves. Very exciting, we could really use her guidance. And you know, now that she's back in the picture, a few of the dwarves have come forward and suggested that we actually launch an attack on the goblins. And you know what? I'd have to agree. It's about damn time. And I think that next episode, after we deal with that forgotten beast, and possibly that bronze colossus, we should go on the attack. Very exciting. Yes, I think next episode is going to be filled with action. Because the time has come to launch a strike against the Torment of Witches. Hello, you bearded bastards. We're here at the end of the episode to show off some more fan artwork. Very exciting, and I gotta say this is quickly becoming one of my favorite parts of the episode. Definitely, there are so many talented people out there. Anyways, let's get to it. The first piece of the day is called Columns of Asylum, and it is done by Aiden. And you can see it clearly depicts our stalagmite asylum that we have down in the Quartzite Caverns. Very creepy too, isn't it? You gotta love that, you can see all the mushrooms there. A very dark scene, just dimly lit by these torches attached to the actual stalagmites. And you know something I really like here, and I'm not too sure how it was done, is that you can see these mushrooms far back, they're kind of blurry. It's a very interesting depth of field effect. Kind of makes the image seem 3D, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm definitely a big fan here. Fantastic work, Aiden. I love this. Big time. Crayons? I think this is crayon. Nice choice. Excellent work. And moving on, our second piece of the day is entitled Attir, and is done by Matt Svensson, and uh, clearly depicts Attir, our Baroness, looking absolutely stunning in her red bandana, her pigtail trousers, and her mule leather cloak. Yeah, all the details are there and they're beautifully rendered. And also you can see that she's holding and looks to be admiring Rutho Sheth Ustuthstorla, the Iron Crown artifact that she created. And remember that also depicted the death of a sow. An ominous omen indeed. Man oh man, such good work on this piece as a whole. I could just imagine a Honey Stoker comic with art that looks like this. Man, I would read that in an instant. Definitely fantastic work here, Matt. Just beautiful. And same for yours as well, Aiden. That's for damn sure. Thanks again, you two. And also a thanks to all of you out there for watching. I've said it before and I will say it a million times. That I would be absolutely nothing without you guys. Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and I certainly hope to see you next week. Here in Stetargus, gosh. Honey Stoker. And until then, you bearded bastards. <laughs>